Hello everyone and welcome to Reference King. This is a film review, analysis, and discussion podcast. Today's film is Annihilation, which originally came out in theaters in 2017. The film is written and directed by Alex Garland. He came into the spotlight with his debut feature film, Ex Machina, which he wrote and directed back in 2015. He was one of A24's first big hits. It actually won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects that year, which was a big upset to a lot of people because it went up against The Force Awakens. However, I think it was the better choice for the winner because visual effects in Ex Machina do not look like visual effects. They look like things that are real and actually happening. Whereas everything in Star Wars looks like visual effects, there's just more of them. Anyway, with that out of the way, he currently has a show airing on FX and Hulu called Devs, D's and Daryl, EVS. Now, one thing a lot of people will not know, but came to light one to two years ago, is that Alex Garland actually shadow directed the film Dread from 2012 before he directed Ex Machina in 2015. Now, for anybody who's unfamiliar, shadow directing is the same thing as ghostwriting, essentially. It's where there's somebody behind the scenes who does all of the actual work uh, to get the thing made, and somebody else is credited with it. Now, this is the part of the podcast where I'm going to give people a chance to go watch the film if they have not already seen it. Annihilation is currently available on Amazon Prime. If you have Amazon Prime, you can go stream it for free. There's no excuse not to watch it. You have all weekend. This podcast comes out on Fridays. Now, if you're unsure if you want to watch this film, here are several films that it is similar to. So if you've seen any of these, it'll give you an idea of whether or not you're interested. The first being Arrival from 2015, starring Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner, directed by Denis Villeneuve. The other three are Alien from 1979 by Ridley Scott, Prometheus from 2013, also by Ridley Scott, and Alien Covenant from 2017, same year as Annihilation, also by Ridley Scott. Now, if you do not like the Alien films because they're too scary because of the monsters and the body horror and the dark, oppressive, and violent atmosphere. Don't worry, Annihilation is not nearly as terrifying, dark, or generally violent as any of the Alien films. It is closer to Arrival with just a dash of what's going on in Alien. So, with that out of the way, I will give a very brief summary of the film's plot before we get into the film just in case you still aren't sure whether or not it's something you're interested in. Natalie Portman stars as Lena, an army veteran turned cellular biologist. Her husband, Kane, played by Oscar Isaac, who you'll know as Poe Dameron from Star Wars The Force Awakens, shows up at home a year after leaving for a secret mission. He's currently a member of the United States Armed Forces. That's how the two of them met. Kane returns home without remembering where he was or how he got back. He suddenly begins bleeding profusely and enters critical condition for unknown reasons. No doctor can diagnose what is wrong with him, and he is quarantined. It is up to Lena to discover where he was and what happened to him so that she can try to find a way to save him. So, getting to why a lot of people did not know about this film. There's a very irritating practice in the movie world among executives. It's where one executive, Executive A, greenlights a film. Greenlighting is where you hear the pitch for a movie, you hear what it's going to be, what it's about, what you want it to look and feel like, and what the story is, and the executive goes, yes, okay, I'm going to give X amount of dollars to you to go make that movie. So Executive A, greenlights Annihilation. But before Annihilation is finished, it's been shot, it's being edited, it's almost done, and it's almost about to be released in theaters. Executive A takes a position at a different studio. Executive B becomes the head of Paramount, where Annihilation is. 
Executive B doesn't care about Annihilation because his name is not on it. If Annihilation fails, it will be blamed on Executive A, who had just left the company. So Executive B doesn't give any special treatment to any of the projects that were about to be released that he or she is not responsible for. They will do the bare minimum that they are contractually obligated to with a film. So Annihilation had to be released nationally in North America, all major theaters all over the country, and it had to have a marketing campaign with a teaser trailer and an official main trailer. So those three things happened. However, they did as little marketing as possible with those two trailers. It screened before very few movies in theater, and the trailers were mostly just dumped online on Facebook and YouTube, and not much was done to promote them or try and get people to notice them. So the other thing they did was... They did not release the film in theaters internationally. What they did do was release it on Netflix internationally. So anywhere that wasn't America or Canada got the film on Netflix the same day it came out in theaters in America and Canada. Now, why is that a problem, you might say? All the people around the world get to just watch it for free the same day. Good for them. They don't have to pay for it. Well, the problem is, when you do that the same day something comes out in the theater, means a lot of people in America and Canada aren't going to pay for it either. Because when you release something on Netflix simultaneously, it makes it really easy to pirate the movie. Because there's immediately an HD streamed copy of the movie available, not just terrible low-quality videos of somebody taking their cell phone or some sort of other camera into a theater and pointing it at a screen and hitting record and then posting that terrible recording of a movie from a theater online later. That's not what you're watching. You're watching the movie in high def the same day that it comes out in theater and it costs you nothing instead of $15. So a lot of people who might have gone to see it in theaters would have been able to stream it very, very easily the day that it came out. And uh, I think that definitely hurt it. So with Annihilation's budget that is estimated to be between 40 to $55 million, it only ended up grossing about $43.1 million over the course of its entire theatrical run. The film is seen by a moderate number of people, 3 to $4 million in theaters, which is pretty good. Um, but it's not great, and it's not what the film needed to do. All that being said, that is why not a lot of people heard about Annihilation in the first place, but that doesn't mean that it's not worth your time or that it's a film that more people shouldn't see. More people should see it. It's a really, really great movie, and it's one that I think has continued to catch new viewers over time since it's become available after its theatrical release as more people have found out about it. Um, I would hope that even more people find out about it over time. I think history will look back kindly on Annihilation, though I think there will always be comparisons to Arrival, which is unfortunate. Um, But they are similar, so I get it. Now, I want to talk about the film's story structure for a minute. The film's story structure is basically the exact same as a Lovecraft story. For anybody who doesn't know, Lovecraft story is in reference to a 19th century author named H.P. Lovecraft, who created a genre called weird fiction, which people generally refer to as cosmic horror. The stories are about people encountering aliens, entities, and phenomena that are beyond human comprehension that drive them crazy when they encounter it. So you see something so unimaginable that your brain literally can't handle it and your brain turns to soup. The other thing that can happen that drives people crazy is that the thing they see itself isn't unimaginable, but its mere existence contradicts fundamental beliefs in their worldview 
and they can't reconcile it. And that starts to drive him crazy because it undermines everything they've ever believed and they no longer have faith in anything. So this film is very, very similar to, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. Lovecraft stories also start at the end of the story and they are being told to the reader by an unreliable narrator who had earlier in the story witnessed unimaginable, horrible, cosmic things that drove them mad. And it is that insane person telling you about the things they saw that they cannot articulate. That's how the stories work. That is what is happening in Annihilation. We are starting at the end of the story in the very first scene. We meet Lena, who is the main character, played by Natalie Portman. She is sitting in a quarantine room. Several men in hazmat suits are interrogating her or interviewing her. It's not very aggressive, so we can say interviewing. So they're interviewing her, and then one of the walls of the room is made entirely of windows, and there are about 50 people standing outside the windows staring in at Lena. All of these people are wearing blue scrubs, uh, face masks, and safety glasses. So you can't tell any of them apart. These people are supposed to represent us, the audience, observing Lena and listening to her story. Okay. So the guy in the hazmat suit starts asking her questions. And if you pay attention to some of her answers and then the events that occur later in the film, you realize that they don't line up and that you can't trust what Lena is saying. Now, there are two forms of distrust that we have to establish really quick. One, the Lena we're looking at is not Lena. It is an alien doppelganger of Lena that does not know it's an alien doppelganger and believes itself to be Lena, which is a little confusing, but the short version is it's not Lena, it's an alien pretending to be Lena. Okay, so there are the mistakes that are made when Lena is recounting things, and there are the mistakes that are made when Lena is recollecting things. Now, what that means is there is a line where the man in the hazmat suit interviewing Lena asks her what happened to her three teammates after they entered the Shimmer. She answers that she doesn't know what happened to two of them, but that one of them definitely died. However, when watching the film, we see two of them die, and one of them turn into a person made out of flowers. So we know what happened to them. Lena knows what happened to them, but she lies and says that she doesn't know. Now, why is this the case? Well, it's because, like I said, this isn't Lena. This is an alien pretending to be Lena that doesn't know it's an alien and actually thinks it's Lena. It has her memories, but they are imperfect and fragmented. So, the events we see in the film are a privileged perspective. We are seeing things that she is not telling to the man in the hazmat suit. So all the man in the hazmat suit knows is that Lena doesn't know what happened to two out of her four teammates. What we, the audience, know is that Lena knows what happened to all four of her teammates because we see what happens to them. Okay? So this is an important distinction. There is mistakes both in her recounting to the man in the hazmat suit and in her recollection, which is the events we, the audience, get to see throughout the course of the film. One of these mistakes is the tattoo. There is a tattoo that appears on several of Lena's teammates throughout the course of the film. The tattoo is never mentioned. There are never close-up shots of it. You can just see in certain scenes one of them has it, 
but then they don't have it anymore and somebody else has it. This is because Lena is misremembering things because she wasn't there. These are the memories of the actual Lena as being interpreted by the current alien pretending to be Lena. Okay. Two other mistakes that enforce this interpretation of the story. One, when Lena arrives to the lighthouse at the end of the film and sees that there is a videotape pointed at the corpse sitting in the corner of the room, she watches it and discovers that that is her dead husband, Kane, and that the Kane that came home is actually an alien doppelganger, not the real Kane. Now, that's not important. What's important is that Oscar Isaac uses, uses a southern accent in the recording of his suicide by phosphorus grenade. Oscar Isaac, the doppelganger, does not use a southern accent throughout the film. Now that on its own, you know, that doppelganger of Cain doesn't know that he's supposed to use an accent. Sure thing. He's making a mistake the same way the doppelganger of Lena's making a mistake. That doesn't really tell us anything. What does tell us something is all the flashbacks Lena has of Cain. All of the flashbacks she has with him, where they're at home before he leaves for the mission, are not something that the doppelganger is telling to the man in the hazmat suit. They are recollections that we, the audience, are get to seeing. And him not having a southern accent is a mistake in her remembering of Cain. Because she only knew the doppelganger Cain. She, the doppelganger, did not ever meet the actual Cain. So she is misremembering that detail. The last piece of evidence to establish that Lena doesn't know what she's talking about and that she's an alien is the very last scene of the movie. Lena is released from containment in her room to go see Oscar Isaac Kane in his containment in his room. When she gets there, she asks him if he's Kane. He thinks for a moment and answers, I don't think so. He asks her, are you Lena? She thinks for a moment and then takes a shuddering breath and has an expression of realization as if she has finally realized she is not Lena. Now that on its own is tenuous. But then the two of them hug, and we get a close-up shot of Oscar Isaac's eyes. In his eyes, we see the shimmer. Then it cuts to a close-up shot of Natalie Portman's eyes, and we see the shimmer. So they are both doppelganger aliens, and anything any of the government agencies in the film know is just what the alien doppelganger of Lena has told to them. What we, the audience, know is that information plus a little extra information that they don't get to see or hear about. But even the information we get is still unreliable because there are details that are getting mixed up. Okay, so that's a big part of the film that I don't hear a lot of people talk about. I don't know why people don't talk about it, but this is absolutely critical to understanding the movie because a lot of people go like, wait, but why are her eyes shiny at the end? We saw her put the grenade in the hand of the alien and make it explode. And then the lighthouse burned down and she died. That's what I saw. Why is she an alien now? It's because she lied. Because the thing that you saw is just what's being told to you by the alien. It's not actually what happened. You can't trust anything that happens in the movie. So I know a lot of people have gotten confused about the ending for that reason, because they take what they see at face value, but you can't. It's a lie. All right, moving on. Oh, that was a, 
Well, sorry, that's that's been bothering me for a long time that a lot of people seem to get confused by that or, or don't know what's going on in the movie or how to watch it. Um, but hopefully that cleared up any confusion anybody was having with how to watch the movie or understand what is happening in it. Now, there's a whole bunch of little things about the movie that I'm going to cover in all sorts of random orders. So again, if you haven't seen the movie, this is going to make no sense, probably. Also, I just spoiled the entire ending of the movie and the fact that you can't trust the movie, so I don't know what you're doing here. Go watch the movie, please. It's really good. Okay. There is excellent writing and structure on display in this movie. So one thing is the ramp-up of horrific and unexplainable phenomenon throughout the course of the film. It is a classic narrative curve of starting at the bottom of the chart and just gradually ramping up to the climax and then having a little denouement. This movie follows that exactly. Well, I mean, the movie doesn't go in chronological order, but if you look at the events in chronological order, it totally does that. All right, so here's what I'm talking about. Once the team enters the Shimmer, these are the unexplainable and weird and horrific phenomena that occur in order. We establish Lena waking up in a tent, and she doesn't remember anything after entering the Shimmer. Neither does anybody else in their team. They're looking at their food rations, trying to figure out how long they've been there. And they estimate about three days. Now, this is interesting because earlier the man in the hazmat suit asked her, how long do you think you were in there? And she's like, I don't know, a couple days, maybe a couple weeks at most. And he's like, you were gone for four months and you only had food for like three weeks. So we don't know how you survived. And Lena goes, I don't know how we did that either because we didn't have enough food and we didn't hunt or fish or anything. So... It's interesting that, for whatever reason, when in the Shimmer, people can't tell time accurately, but they also seem to be unable to eat properly, or even need to eat properly. Um, just, as a, just as an interesting little side note. So, she doesn't remember anything after entering the Shimmer, neither does anybody else. They think they know how long they've been there, but they actually don't and none of their navigation or communication equipment works. Okay, so on paper, pretty weird. In the film, it's just kind of like, ah, oh, she wakes up, they're not really sure, and their compass doesn't work. Okay, whatever. Well, then they find a big, long stretch of flowers wrapped around the dock uh, next to a house, and she explains that this flower is literally impossible because it is multiple species of flowers connected to the same root. Then, a giant mutant gator appears and attacks them. Lena has a wonderful moment where she drops to one knee, completely hones in on the gator, and just unloads on it and kills it without any issue. This is one of my favorite moments in the film, and it always felt like a really zen moment to me, where Lena is very distressed throughout the film because she's trying to figure out a way to save who she believes is her husband and she doesn't know what she's doing and the shimmer has affected everybody's memory and nobody knows what's going on but lena knows how to shoot and how to kill and nobody else in her team knows how to do it like she does so she has to step in and take over and kill that gator and she does and it's awesome so she kills the gator. They open up its mouth. Uh, it's got shark teeth. That's impossible. You can't crossbreed from different species. Uh. So we have no memory, broken navigation, impossible flower, impossible gator. Okay. Then we get to the base of the previous team that had gone into the Shimmer, which had included her husband. And they find an SD card and watch what is on it. What is on it is Kane slicing open one of his teammates' stomachs 
and then sticking his hand inside and us seeing a giant, essentially turbine of worm-like intestinal tentacles spinning around Kane's hand as if the other soldiers' organs have come alive and, and become an entity all their own that is living inside of him. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, it's so crazy, in fact, that Anya doesn't believe it, refuses to watch the video again to confirm whether it's real or not, and says everybody's being stupid and it's a trick of the light. This leads to one of the only problems I have with the film, and it annoys me greatly. So we'll get to that. So SD card... Then we get to see the fungal corpse of that cut open soldier in the pool, which is wild, an uh, absolutely fantastic production design. Then we see Lena, a slide of Lena's cells, which are mutating. Then we see the bear grab Shepard and take her into the forest. Then we see the field filled with flower people. Uh, which is literally impossible, just like everything else that happened before, is Lena going, no, that's literally impossible. And then we get our second encounter with the bear, where it screams with Shepard's voice outside of the house, which lures Anya out of the house. And then it comes back, and then it eats Anya, which is absolutely fantastic, because, wow, I could not stand Anya at this point, and also, it is the one moment in the film where it gets really brutal and violent and horrifying and it absolutely nails it. And, uh, it's, it's up there for my favorite moment in the film. It's, it's up there. It's, it's really unforgettable. Absolutely sears itself into your brain. Uh, it's the one thing that might turn away more squeamish viewers, I would say. So then, uh, we get, Jennifer Jason Lee exploding into the alien uh, in the basement of the lighthouse. The basement of the lighthouse is just a horrible H.R. Giger nightmare room. And then we get Lena's doppelganger forming out of the alien and fighting her, or at least mimicking her, which is an important note. It is not fighting her. It is only mimicking her. So we go from, oh, I can't really remember how long we've been here, to cloud of gas and light turning into a doppelganger of the main character and then taking her place and not remembering that she is the doppelganger and in fact believe she is the original there's a gulf between those two things and there are a lot of steps in between and the film does a great job going like oh look weird interspecies flower Oh, interspecies gator, interspecies, interspecies, and it just keeps going up one thing at a time until the movie gets absolutely wild. So that is something I think is absolutely fantastic about the movie. Now let's get to some of the things I don't like about the movie, like Anya. Anya's fine up until she refuses to believe what she saw on the tape about the intestines being alive inside of the dead soldier. It's frustrating as an audience member because you're just screaming at the TV, hey, what do you mean you don't believe it or it's a trick of the light? Everybody just saw the same thing. It's video evidence. It was very clear. Come on. What are you talking about? And then, it, and then jo Josie goes, well, just, just watch it again and you'll see. And she goes, no, I'm not going to watch it again. Now I get it. Her character wants to deny what she has just seen. It's impossible. She can't deal with it. So instead of confronting it or reconciling it, she turns away from it because she just can't even. Okay, so it's, an, it's frustrating, but I can get over it. Later... Anya starts to go crazy, so she ties up Ventress, Jennifer Jason Lee, Lena, Natalie Portman, and Josie, I don't know the actress, uh, in a bunch of chairs, and she questions Lena on who the man in her locket is. Is it her husband, her brother, her father, her boyfriend, whatever? And based on Lena's reaction, she goes, okay, it's your husband. 
all right, so Lena's a huge liar, so we can't trust Lena, so I'm going to cut Lena's face off. And it's just kind of like, oh, okay, this seems like a huge overreaction. And I get it. It's the shimmer, and the film established earlier that, hey, you know, we know that one of two things happened to the group that previously went in here. Either they went crazy and killed each other, or something killed them. And she's like, well, I guess they went crazy and killed each other. Time for me to go crazy and kill everybody. It's, it's, I get it. The film justifies it, but the fact that there was video evidence to the contrary earlier that she just refuses to accept that ultimately leads to her going crazy and trying to kill everybody else before they can kill her is irritating. It's also annoying that Natalie Portman hiding her, the fact that Kane is her husband um, is used as evidence by Anya to go, we can't trust Lena time, time to kill her. Uh, This annoys me because there's actually no given reason in the film for why Lena doesn't tell everybody Kane is her husband. There's a conversation she has with Ventress before she goes into the Shimmer or joins the team that's going into the Shimmer, where she goes, Ventress asks, oh, so why didn't you tell them that he's your husband? And Natalie Porton's response is, well, I knew it would complicate things. And then Ventress is like, why? And she's like, oh, because you want to join the team. Okay, you can come get in. Other than that line, there is no justification for why she wouldn't tell them that Kane is her husband. And after this scene, I know that the only reason the writer did that was so that this scene with Anya could happen to make Lena untrustworthy in her eyes. There's, There's no other reason. So that irritates me. The other thing is Shepard gets attacked and dragged away by a bear. And uh, when they faintly hear Shepard screams later, uh, they go, oh man, Shepard might still be alive. We found her bag. We can f- faintly hear her scream. Actually, the characters don't notice the faint scream of Lena and the dis- of Shepard in the distance. I noticed it. And I think it's a great little touch to foreshadow that the bear can do that later on. Something you probably won't notice on a first viewing, but to f- just faintly hear it in the background on a second or third viewing is really rewarding. So they find Shepard's stuff and they're like, oh, we got to go check, see if Shepard's actually dead. Maybe she's alive. And Lena's like, okay, I'll go. And Josie or Anya goes, yeah, I'll join you. And she goes, no, no, I'll go by myself. And then she goes and finds Shepard and Shepard's dead. And it's, it's uh, pretty metal. Uh, she's all ripped up. And then Lena looks over and sees two doppelganger deer, which, you know, that's pretty cool. It's a nice little peaceful moment where you see the beauty uh, that the Shimmer can create, not just the horror. Um, it does lead to one of my great disappointments of the film, which is at the very beginning, the Lena who is telling us the events of the story mentions that there were doppelgangers. And so the whole film I was waiting for there to just be doppelgangers of the team showing up and for just madness to ensue. Uh but these deer are the only instance of doppelgangers we see up until the very end of the movie. So it is what it is. But Shepard's dead, super metal, and she comes back to the group and she goes, Shepard's totally dead. Cut back to Anya holding everybody captive in the house. I'm irritated because there's no reason for Lena not to have somebody accompany her when she finds Shepard's corpse. She just goes alone. There's no reason for her to not tell them that Cain is her husband. She just doesn't. These are the two major pieces of information that Anya uses to go, we can't trust Lena because we don't know if Shepard's really dead and she didn't tell us this guy was her husband, so I'm going to cut her face off. Ah! And then she hears Shepard's screams outside of the house going, Help! And then, as we know, she goes outside and then comes back in and there's a big bear and it mauls her to death and it's radical. I get that her not trusting whether or not Shepard is dead sets up her being tricked by the screams of the bear 
pretending to be Shepard. But there was no reason for nobody else to go with Lena to find Shepard's body. Now, could have easily just had Ventress go with her, right? Because Anya doesn't like or trust Ventress. Could have even had Josie, but Ventress would have worked better. Had the two of them go, come back, go, no, you know, uh, she's totally dead. Don't worry about it. We saw. And then later she could have just been like, you two both went, but Josie and I didn't see. I should have gone, but I didn't, but I don't know. Like, anybody else could have gone with Lena and we could have ended up at the same result. She didn't have to go alone for Anya to not believe her. So, yeah, it, it, it could have worked whether Lena was alone or paired up with somebody else. Just as long as Anya didn't go, the scene could have worked. It, it feels arbitrary and kind of lazy and unnecessary, and I, I don't like it. It's, it's not the best. It's, it's one of the only flaws I have with the film. Um, I feel like I had one other flaw. No, I can't even remember. Shows you how good the movie is. I can't even remember what my other problem with the film is going to be. One thing I really like about the bear having Shepard's voice, I don't really like the whole thing uh, Josie says. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that after. But the thing I really like about the bear is that it uses Shepard's voice. Duh, that's awesome. No point in saying that you like that. Except that that is a very common aspect to monsters in old folklore and legends. So I can't remember the name of the creature right now, but there's an old African uh, folk tale about a specific type of monster that would live in the woods and would use the voice of your family members to call out to you to try to lure you in the woods. And there are examples of creatures like that in just about every culture. So I always thought that was a really interesting idea and it was really great to see that implemented by this horrible mutant sci-fi bear in this future time movie with crazy alien events going on. Um, it's the type of thing I'd expect to see in a Robert Eggers movie, and I was really pleasantly surprised to see it here. So that's cool. I really like the bear for that reason. The design is okay with its half-rotten face. Uh, it's, it's all right. I get it. It's cool. Um... But the CG for the bear is not to the level of quality that it that I feel like it should have been. Um, it has the problem of just looking like a big CG bear. And it is the thing that looks the worst in the film. It sticks out like a sore thumb compared to everything else. Kind of like the bear in The Revenant. I think the bear in The Revenant might have looked a bit better. But I mean, they both just look like big, dumb computer bears. They don't look like bear bears. I don't know, which is odd because what was that stupid movie with Will Ferrell? Yeah, that's really specific. Um, Semi-pro. He has to cage fight a bear in that, and I remember that bear looking pretty convincingly real. Or, or at least it felt more real because it was a practical effect rather than a big just CGI space in the frame that they left open for a bear to be inserted in later. Anyway, so not happy with how the bear looks, but the function of the bear in the story and its mauling of Anya both are great, and its folkloric elements are fantastic. Now, the thing I don't like Josie saying about the bear is Shepard's death. She's like, yeah, it must have been like when Shepard died, that one part of her that was afraid and dying in agony lives on in the bear forever. I wouldn't want that. That sounds terrible. I was like, you know what? That's stupid. I get that it's a way to explore Josie's character and her preference for suicide over suffering of any kind and fine, whatever. But that's a stupid idea that part of Shepard lived on or part of her brain was transferred into the bear. You know what's fine? The bear has the ability to mimic sounds. There are birds with that ability. It's just a natural ability that the bear has developed via mutation to mimic specific sounds it, he it hears, and it mimics Shepard screaming for help as it mauled her. That's fine. The idea that part of Shepard's 
neural pathways or spirit or mind or whatever live on trapped in the bear. That's stupid, and I hate it. So, eh, to Josie's little thing there. But that's just Josie's little theory or interpretation. It's not necessarily true to what happens in the film, uh, and it's, it's not objectively true of how the bear works. You know, it's just what the character Josie says. But I don't like what that character Josie says there. I think it's stupid. Anyway, let's talk about the music real quick. There are three types of music in the movie. There's a bunch of country music, which was a big surprise. There are haunting choral arrangements of just a big old chorus going, Ooh, and it's all creepy and sad and mysterious, and it's fantastic. And then there is the fantastic song Alien uh, by the composers Salisbury Steak and Geoff something, or is it Geoff Salisbury and whoever? I don't remember. I remember one of them's last name is Salisbury, like the steak. And that's all I remember. But anyway, the two of them knocked it out of the park with the song Alien that appears at the end when Lena meets the alien. Now, the choral stuff... Obviously, it works super well for the setting, and it feels very fitting. It's creepy. It's haunting. Uh, it's reminiscent of a cloud of witnesses following the events of the film, which also mirrors or parallels, however you want to say it, the group of people in the scrubs watching Lena tell the story, which is reflective of us. So I like that on that level. Um, and I just think it works really well tonally and emotionally. The country music, I think, works. It's just really surprising given the genre. But the first instance of country music being used in the film is the second scene right after we establish Lena talking to the hazmat suit guys. We cut to the alien hurtling through space and then crash landing on Earth. And the very second we cut to it, the little boom, 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 little guitar sounds come in. And it it's just this great way of trying to show you, hey, here are these grand cosmic big brow, big brain concepts that the movie's going to show you and explore. But we're going to keep it grounded in all of the human elements in the film. We're, we're going to keep it textured and real and down to earth as much as possible while exploring these crazy impossible cosmic things um and i think that's the function of the country music and i think it does an excellent job especially the use of the song helplessly hoping so two reasons for that one it's just a really good song that's really emotional so when lena is painting her bedroom and Cain suddenly appears, and that song is playing, you get feelings, which, you know, that's part of what I paid for, so I'm really happy about that. Even though it's making me really sad in a bittersweet way uh, at his, uh, his return. Um, another reason that song's inclusion is fantastic is <laughs> because of the lyrics, where it's like... Uh, standing by the stairway uncertain waiting to tell you and then there's a point where the song talks about waiting by a window and Kane waits by a window and then is standing by the stairway while that part of the song mentions waiting by a window and standing by a stairway so that's really excellent uh and then finally is what's the part of the song it goes one person two alone three together, and four each other. And the four being a nice little pun within the song itself. But that line in particular, I think, is why the song is used in the film. Because the third scene of the movie is Lena talking to one of her graduate-level medical classes about cellular biology. And she is explaining how life works, how it comes into being and replicates and reproduces and you start with one cell and then you get two cells and then four cells and then eight cells and then six cells. So the lyrics of the song are mimicking 
her explanation of one becomes two becomes four becomes eight becomes 16 becomes 32 the one person two alone three together for each other it, both are about reproduction replication and then uh relationship to one another after reproduction and replication or relationship to accomplish reproduction and replication she also in this line mentions that all life started with a single cell all by itself on planet earth four billion years ago now this line is really interesting because it comes immediately after we see one single alien hurtled to earth all by itself and crash land in the lighthouse so we see that alien all alone then we get her explanation of a single solitary cell being all by itself attempting to reproduce now that's fantastic um the other thing that is set up in this scene is cancer because lena goes the cell we're looking at is melanoid carcinoma cancer and one of you needs to figure out how to cure cancer because cancer's a problem duh so it sets up single solitary cells reproduction and replication and also cancer these three things are all really important throughout the rest of the film so reproduction and replication i believe is the goal of the alien there are multiple times where people go ventress goes i don't know what it wants or if it wants which is a great way to establish unknowable cosmic horror without getting specific and then the doppelganger lena when she's being interviewed later uh after she talks about how she blew up the alien and it burned the lighthouse down and all that stuff the guy in the hazmat suit's like well what did it want it it had to come here for a reason and then she goes i don't know if it wanted right again establishing the whole like it's an alien beyond our comprehension blah 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 type of thing um also important to note about the hazmat suit line of like uh why did it come here there must have been a reason or a purpose or it wanted something feels like a great way for the writer director to go no no sometimes stuff just happens the universe is unknowable and vast and horrifying because it's indifferent so you know no no there wasn't a reason it just it just kind of fell here probably didn't even want to it's probably lost and confused shut up there isn't a reason for everything so that's great but i think the characters all going, I don't know what it wants or if it wants, is just a way for the film to establish the unknowable cosmic horror element. I think it is inaccurate to say that the alien did not want anything. Now, whether it consciously wanted something or if it was just being biologically motivated, I think it wanted to reproduce, whether consciously or unconsciously. I think that the whole film is that the alien is there alone and it is trying to find a way to not be alone this being represented by one you know lena in that previous scene i mentioned is telling us cells are meant to replicate and reproduce and blah 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 and it all started with one cell that was all by itself a long time ago so there's that and there's also the ending of the film which is the alien made Kane's doppelganger and then it made Lena's doppelganger and then it destroyed the lighthouse and the shimmer and all the mutations it had created. It abandoned all of that and destroyed it, allowing the humans to believe that it was no longer alive so that Lena and Kane doppelgangers could be together. Like, I, I really think consciously or unconsciously that was its its motivation or its plan or its goal the entire time was to reproduce and to create doppelgangers of itself to be with itself so that it wasn't alone with itself. Um, yeah, so that's the whole thing. And then cancer. So cancer is one of the only other things, one of the little nitpicky things that I have a problem with in the film. We establish cancer in that opening scene, and then Lena's talking to Shepard later. Shepard 
establishes the self-destruction complex of the movie where she goes like, so what's wrong with you? We're all damaged goods. Look at Josie's arms. They're all covered in scars. She tried to kill herself. And Anya is sober, which means she was an addict slash alcoholic. And nobody knows what's wrong with Ventress, but she's got problems. And then Lena's like, uh, my husband died. Lie. And then Shepard goes, oh, I'm sorry. My daughter died. And Lena's like, oh, that's really sad. And Shepard's like, yeah, she died from leukemia. And so we go, okay, cancer count number two. Cancer. It's important, says the movie. All right, fine. Then we move forward and we find out, oh, hey, you know who else has cancer? Freaking Ventress. And it's like, oh, Oh, okay. So we talk about cancer, and her daughter died of cancer, and Ventress is dying of cancer. That's a lot of cancer. I I know, I know that like establishing something three times is how the human brain recognizes a pattern more easily instead of two times, and it establishes that the cancer thing is important on purpose. But when they go, yeah, Ventress has it too, I was like, oh man, everybody's got cancer in this movie. And it it felt like a little too much cancer for me. Uh, I prefer no cancer, uh, personally, but uh, in the movie it felt like just one instance too many. But it's okay, it just felt a little heavy-handed, just the tiniest bit too much pressure. Um, But it does lead to one of Ventress's best lines in my opinion which is where Shepard's dead and Anya's dead and Josie and Lena and Ventress are all at the house and Ventress is like all right I'm going to the lighthouse see you two later and they're like don't go and she's like I'm going see ya but right before she leaves um she says I'm gonna go because we're being mutated by the shimmer we don't know how long we have. I gotta I gotta get to the lighthouse. Because this thing, referring to the effect of the shimmer, is like the opposite of Alzheimer's. And the person who started this journey won't be the one who finishes it. So one, the line of it's like the opposite of Alzheimer's is really interesting to me. Because it reminds me of Amy Adams in Arrival. Spoilers for Arrival for the next 10 seconds. um, Where we see flash forwards throughout the film. And we think they are flashbacks. um, But they are actually Amy Adams' brain starting to rewire itself to give us premonitions of what is to come. And also, she starts having really horrible weird confusing dreams where uh you know instead of forrest whitaker telling her to go to sleep it's a giant alien um so the opposite of alzheimer's thing reminds me of that where it's technically your brain is improving you're starting to see things on a higher level of consciousness or or you're able to look at time from a different perspective but initially while that transition is happening it's very disorienting And it's your brain not working and being able to think and act in the way that it is supposed to. So I think that opposite of Alzheimer's line is really interesting. But what's important is the line where she goes, the person who started this journey won't be the one who ends it, which is a great line for Ventress to have specifically because it's the same thing that people think about with terminal illness. It's that thing where they go, I don't want... Uh, what is it? It's in uh, Breaking Bad. Walter White talks about watching his dad slowly die and how he's like, at the end, his breath was like the rattling of an empty tin can and there wasn't even a person there anymore. And he should have just died way earlier because he just suffered needlessly and he wasn't the same. He was just a husk of who he used to be. My dad wasn't there at the end. And that's a very common line of thinking when it comes to terminal illness uh that's the way a lot of people feel and that is um it's just it's just very common for people to express experiences like that watching loved ones deteriorate over time 
and say that they weren't even there anymore or it was good that they died or you know they were a shell and just just things of that nature so Ventress having that line is good because even though she's talking about the effects of the shimmer it works as an analogy for what she would go through with her terminal cancer and why she is so motivated to press forward even if it means her death because Ventress like the man in the hazmat suit says never planned on coming back from the mission. Ventress just wanted to know what was in the lighthouse and die. So this leads to another Josie line. Man, I feel bad for Josie, but she just got all the lines I didn't really care for. So after Ventress leaves, we get a moment with Lena and Josie sitting outside of the house after Anya has died. They're just sitting amongst the flower people. And Lena's all like, all right, we should probably get going. I know she left early, but we still got to get to that lighthouse. And then Josie goes, you, Ventress wants to face it, and you want to fight it. I don't think I want either of those things. And then she walks off into a field and becomes a flower person. And it's like, oh, okay. And my problem with that is that it's an analogy for suicide and it makes suicide seem like this really beautiful, peaceful, wonderful thing. That's just like totally an option all the time for anybody. And it's, it's fine and it's nice. And it's like, no, like you can present suicide as an option for a character. And that's cool. Uh, that's, that's not my issue. It's, it's my issue is that it's presented as this, beautiful ascendance into something else and that her becoming a flower person feels kind of like an ascendance to heaven or an afterlife where she's like oh the things of this world are no longer my problem and i'm not even alive and i'm just gonna become a beautiful flower person forever and then she does and it's like okay that's not the reality of that though it, it feels like a false analogy or it feels emotionally and tonally inconsistent with the reality of like, I don't want to, I don't want to deal with the lighthouse slash the cancer slash the whatever. I'm just going to, I'm just going to kill myself now. It's like, that is a severe thing. And I, I don't really like it being portrayed in that way, uh, emotionally and tonally. Uh, not a fan. Um, it's also important to point out that this scene is the first time we see Josie not wearing her long sleeves or long sleeve jacket over the course of the film. And it's, and, and that's why I'm saying it is an analogy for suicide specifically, not just an interesting decision that a character makes to not confront the antagonist. Um, we know from Shepard earlier that Josie had tried to commit suicide or at least consistently uh, self-harmed. And she goes, you know, look at the scars on her arms. But we are never able to before this moment. And then in this moment, Josie is not wearing the jacket and, and is laying bare uh, her nature to harm herself. And then does so in the most ultimate and final way by surrendering to the shimmer uh, and, and choosing to die. So, you know. Uh, I like that she's not wearing the jacket. That's a nice touch, but I don't like the overall tone of the scene. Uh, it's not the greatest. Now, I know I've pointed out a lot of nitpicks. I do think this movie's great. I think the monsters are great. The tension is great. The alien is great. The cosmic horror, um, even though like it's a bit heavy handed with the cancer or I don't really like how it sets things up for Anya to distrust Lena or, you know, the, the, the way Josie like dies in this scene or, or at least the emotional tone of the scene in which she dies. Those are the only three problems I have with the whole movie. Um, those are pretty small problems for other people. I'm just crazy and fixate on them. This movie has absolutely wonderful cinematography it uses very few shots per scene. They're always pretty, like in mediums or in wides. There are very few close-ups. It just leaves the camera 
in place or has it moving very fluidly and gently so that you get to really look around and take in the environment and the mutations and the group of people and how they are interacting with each other and their environment. The three types of music and the way they're each used are pitch perfect to the movie and create a, a tone and an emotional effect that I haven't seen in a movie in the genre before. Um, the performances are good to great all around. The lines and writing, other than the nitpicks I've pointed out, is excellent. Um, it is a wonderful movie on just about every level. Also, the editing is really, really, really nice. It's very smooth, and they do a great job cutting from Lena at the end of the story to telling the story throughout the Shimmer to cutting to further flashbacks of Lena's life with Kane. Um, they do a good job blending those three different points in time and making it all feel really fluid and not having a single jarring cut in the movie. Uh, the, mo the movie's excellent, if that was not clear. And I, I absolutely adore it. Um, that's why I'm talking about it. But in talking about it, I just do want to point out the nitpicks and the problems and the things that I go, uh, these have for the last three years bothered me about this movie. It's been enough time. It's not just me. These are kind of irritating. So yeah, so that's that. This is a good movie. I like it. There is a visual motif throughout the course of the film with a glass of water, a jug of water, and another glass of water. Once at the beginning, when Kane returns home, he's sitting at the table, and Lena's asking him a series of questions, trying to figure out where he was. There's a glass of water sitting on the table. Lena sits at the table across from him. They reach across and hold hands in the center of the table. And there is a shot from the side of the glass of water looking at their hands through the glass of water. And the glass of water, obviously due to how refraction works, is bending and refracting their fingers. The jug of water appears when the team makes it to the base that Kane and his team had previously stayed at, where they see the video of cutting the guy open with the worm tentacle intestines. Uh... It's just when they first enter, there's a jug of water sitting on a table, and it does the same type of shot from the side, and it frames Natalie Portman through the jug of water. It's only for a moment as it's laterally dollying, um, and she walks past it. So it's just for a second, but it's there, and she's the only one framed inside the jug of water. And then the third time is at the end, when she has a glass of water sitting on a table next to her while she's talking to the man in the hazmat suit who's in... In interviewing her uh, and it does the same thing as the first time there's a glass of water at the beginning of the movie I think that this is supposed to represent the refraction effect of the shimmer on Lena and how this is not the real Lena I think it happens in the first scene to establish that that cane holding her hand is not the real Kane. He's a warped version of her. And I think the jug of water, which is a less severe refraction effect in the shot, is meant to go, this isn't Lena either, or this is Lena in transition as she's being mutated by the shimmer. And then the third and final time with the glass of water in the interrogation room, or quarantine room where she's being interviewed, is again to show us that wasn't Kane at the beginning. This is not Lena at the end. Um, I think it's just a visual indication of who is and isn't a doppelganger and who is in transition uh, via mutation or who will end up being a doppelganger, which is just Kane and Lena. Um, I really like its inclusion. I think that's what it means. I might be wrong. I don't know. But either way, I like it because it leads to really nice shots of stuff being bent through refracted water in a glass. It looks cool. This connects to the refraction effect of the shimmer. We find out once they get to the field with all the flower people that, hey, if you sequenced one of these flowers, it would totally show you the, the Hawks gene. 
And then Anya's like, I'm a EMT. What is a Hawks gene? And it's, oh, that is the part of our genetic code, which has the architectural structure for the human body, arms to shoulders to torso, torso to hip to legs, all, all, the, all those types of things. We get to that point with the flower people. We're at this point where we get Josie's theory or hypoth- hypothesis, sorry, not theory, hypothesis, that the shimmer is refracting everything uh, from genetic structures to light to radio signals and that all of them are being mutated. And that's where this idea is established other than right before Shepard is attacked by the bear where Lena is looking at a slide of uh, DNA or of cells, blood cells that are her own and she's visibly noticing a mutation in her blood cells. So that's where the mutation thing is established and it's fine. Uh, I get it. I don't know. It's a bit underwhelming to just go, oh, everything's just kind of being refracted. It sounds good on paper, but in practice, I was just like, oh, okay. So the answer to how are all these interspecies things possible is uh, the dome's making it happen. Like saying it's refracting everything isn't an explanation. And I'm not saying I need a bunch of boring sci-fi gobbledygook to explain it. But I guess that's kind of what I'm saying. Is, I don't know. It's a bit underwhelming as a, here's the answer to what's going on in the shimmer. It's just m- messing with everything. Wait, the answer to how is everything being messed with is that it's being messed with? Okay, I guess. I, I like that it is called the shimmer, which is a light and visual based term, and that it is, quote, refracting things. So it's you know, thematically consistent with the naming convention, but it boils down to how is it messing with things? It just is messing with things. Oh, okay then. Sure. How stupid of me. I'm sorry for wanting to know how. Um, I guess that was the other nitpick I had and I just forgot about it. Whoops. Okay. We're pretty much at the end of the movie. There is a, uh couple more points I want to hit, and then we are wrapped up on Annihilation. So Ventress has a conversation with Lena earlier in the film, once again, um, where she establishes that not everybody is suicidal. This is right after, or two, two to three scenes after Shepard has revealed that Josie was suicidal. Um, Ventress says, very few people are actually suicidal, but nearly everybody is self-destructive. And that this is biologically coded into us to break up the happy marriage or drink or do drugs or do whatever thing to lead to our destruction due to our subconscious. Um, This is reminiscent of the death urge theory, uh, which was coming into vogue in the 1960s. I want to say they mention it in the show Mad Men in the the first episode actually um, that all people actually want to die just subconsciously and that they make many decisions all the time that will lead to their death or their potential death because it's what they really want deep down. You get in a car, even though it's really unsafe to drive, same with the plane train, whatever form of transport people smoke or drink all the time, even though they know it's bad for them and that it will one day totally probably kill them. So that is the concept that Ventress is referring to. And it's just saying that it's biologically motivated and that Lena would know more about it than her. So that is also a theme throughout the movie is self-destruction. The line self-destruction, the happy marriage is in reference to the fact that Lena had an affair with one of her coworkers six months after Kane had left. She does this not because she's unhappy with Cain, but one, because the movie's trying to establish the concept of self-destruction, and two, uh, because she thinks Cain's dead and she doesn't know a better way to handle being alone. So she gives into the self-destructive behavior of having an affair with a co-worker who she doesn't really care about, which actually leads to one of my favorite lines in a movie where she asks Dan to leave after they have sex, and Dan says... 
you don't hate me, you hate yourself for what you've done. And Lena goes, no, I hate you too. Get out. And it's, <laughs> it's just the funniest one-liner. And it's so accurate. And it's the line that characters never say when they're having their confrontation, their verbal confrontation in dramas, movies, and shows where characters are like, no, but this and that, and they're hurling insults and things at each other. And it's the type of line where you're always screaming it at the screen where you're like, no, tell him this, tell him this. And then the character actually tells them that. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you suck, Dan, get out of here. So that's really great. But anyway, so self-destruction is an important theme and idea in the movie. And uh, it shows up in the form of Lena's confrontation with her doppelganger in the lighthouse at the end. There are two important things that are expressed in her fight with the doppelganger. So let's be clear, it's not a fight. Lena says it herself. Um, the doppelganger didn't attack me. It mimicked me. I attacked it. So it wasn't a fight. It was just copying everything she did. So the two ideas that are presented in her... F I'm going to call it a fight just to have a word. Well, I'll call it a dance. In her dance with the doppelganger is one, it is often a human reaction to attack that which you are afraid of or do not understand. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not condemning that response necessarily that's a survival response and it's good to have uh, but sometimes it gets us into trouble and it's definitely not how we should respond I don't know that the movie is trying to say that but I see that in the movie Arrival is definitely trying to say that but we're not talking about Arrival so I'll stay on topic the other thing that the movie is saying is that the dance with the doppelganger is meant to visually represent Lena's desire for self-destruction. The theme of self-destruction is established and set up throughout for all the characters. And then the final confrontation of the movie is Lena essentially just attacking herself and then getting beat up by herself. It doesn't say much beyond that. It's it's just a little theming throughout the movie. Um, and I think that's kind of a nice little climax cap off to that particular theme throughout the film. Is that the fight isn't dance, isn't just a fight dance. It is also a way to visually represent a character's internal self-destruction and self-loathing. And the way that we often attack ourselves and berate ourselves and beat ourselves up and keep ourselves down. Um, so yeah, I like seeing that in that scene. That scene in general is also absolutely stunning. There are no words for, I want to say like 10 minutes at the end of the movie. Lena comes across Ventress. Ventress explodes and turns into the alien, and then it makes the doppelganger, and the two of them have their dance. And then Lena, quote, tricks it into holding a phosphorus grenade and then runs out of the lighthouse, and the alien totally explodes and burns up and burns the whole lighthouse down. Except that doesn't happen. That is a lie, slash a misremembrance. The doppelganger killed Lena and burned the lighthouse down and left and is pretending to be Lena. Don't get confused. Don't get it twisted. This final sequence is just absolutely fantastic. I don't have anything in particular to say about it other than, again, the track Alien by Salisbury Steak is fantastic and it fits perfectly with this sequence. The, I believe, Icelandic dancer that they got to play the doppelganger in the silver suit does an excellent job 
uh, synchronizing her movements with Natalie Portman. I'm sure Natalie Portman also did a fantastic job. When you're watching the scene, it looks like they are both doing exactly what they need to. It's just my feeling that if either one of them started to make a movement too early or make a mistake, it would have been Natalie Portman and that the Icelandic dancer was compensating for that. Not that there's evidence of it. It's just my feeling. Uh, but they both do an absolutely fantastic job. It's shot excellently. The music's perfect. Everything works perfectly. All of the writing and the science and the exposition, all of it just falls away at this point in the movie. And you just get this, just this, you just get this moment where everything in the movie feels like it crystallizes into this one point without words. And I think it would be a disservice for me to try and dissect it or talk about it much. I, I really hold to uh, Stanley Kubrick had a quote where he was being asked questions about 2001 A Space Odyssey. And he just said, if I could have said it any other way, I wouldn't have made a film. I think in general that you can dissect and talk about films and, and things that are found within them. But other than what I've already touched on with self-destruction, mankind's uh, initial reaction to attack and, and so on, there's not much else to say in words about this scene. It's just one of the reasons you should watch the movie because it's an incredible scene. Now I do want to talk about the alien's first form which is a cloud of gas with kaleidoscopic colors and a bright yellow light inside of it. I think this is basically just supposed to represent space. It reminds me of high quality pictures and wallpapers I've seen of deep space and uh, big green and red and purple gas clouds giant stars, glittering lights, and, and celestial bodies and things floating out in, uh, in the cosmos. It, it reminds me of those pictures of those elements, and I think that's what it's trying to call forth. In addition, I think it is trying to call forth um, a kaleidoscope or hallucinogenic elements with all of the colors uh, that it has and the fact that it is inverting on itself infinitely. Um, so I think it is trying to conjure up images of space and hallucinations uh, from hallucinogenics. The other thing that's important is the bright yellow light. I think it's supposed to kind of represent the light of a star. I also think it is supposed to act as the light that draws a moth to a flame or the little bioluminescent light that hangs in front of an angler fish's mouth to draw prey in so that it can snap them up. When Lena sees the alien take it that form and she sees the light, she cannot help but stare at it wide-eyed and slowly march towards it as if her brain has turned off and she is just primally being pulled to this beautiful thing, lulling her into a false sense of security. And then it takes a drop of her blood and it turns into a weird doppelganger of her. And then there is an inky shimmer effect behind the doppelganger as it takes its form that I I don't know how else to describe it other than it looks like pools of ink rippling in waves covered in the rainbow look that pool, puddles of water and oil have when you see them in parking lots just rippling all behind the doppelganger and it's it's stunning and then it melts and coalesces back into the walls of the H.R. Giger nightmare basement um, which again, okay, the production design for that room is also incredible, and the visual of Lena entering the lighthouse and not having to climb a staircase to ascend to the top of it, but having to crawl into the basement beneath the ground that is unnaturally there, uh, is great. Also, the fact that she has to crawl into the basement is the opposite of many stories featuring lighthouses that have cosmic horror elements. 
Uh, there's a video game by the name of World of Horror, which has recently come out. The whole point of that is to solve five separate mysteries, each of which earns you a key, which opens one of five padlocks on the door to the town's lighthouse. And at the top of the lighthouse is the old god that you have to defeat to save everybody. And then in the movie The Lighthouse, there is a light at the top of that lighthouse that is important, and I will not say anything beyond that. Uh, but it does relate to the story of Prometheus and to cosmic horror storytelling in general. But the general theme or idea in stories like that is you have to ascend to the top of the lighthouse where, and, and that is where the pinnacle of things are or would be. Whereas in this, it's you have to descend beneath the earth, beneath the lighthouse, which I think is much more fitting because uh, cosmic beings like Cthulhu are usually either amidst the stars or they are beneath the waves at the bottom of the ocean or hidden in the earth or caves or caverns or underneath mountains. They are great ascendant beings who are found seething beneath the surface of things. So I think Annihilation gets that right. Uh, not to say that the others are wrong, but I think this works exceptionally well. Now, the last two things I want to talk about are the title and the sequels that will never be. The title Annihilation is spoken by Jennifer Jason Lee right after Lena finds her in the lighthouse. She has this tiny little speech where she goes, oh, you know, the alien, I don't know what it wants or if it wants, but it's going to unmake us into our smallest parts until there's nothing left but tiny fragments and there's there's we're totally destroyed it'll be annihilation and then her mouth opens and it explodes with lights and colors and she disintegrates into the alien um the first time i saw the movie i went uh when she said the title like that i was like oh that's that's bad. That's not just a, a little nitpick. That that feels that feels kind of dumb and kind of bad. And like you just didn't need to say the title of the movie in the movie, and that the way you decided to didn't work. Like I think you wanted it to. That was bad. It doesn't bother me as much now, but it stuck out like a sore thumb during the first viewing. The book uses the title in a completely different way that I think works significantly better. Now, brief thing about the book, none of the characters have names in the book. They're just known by their positions. So the biologist, the physicist, the chemist, the medic, the whatever, they're all just called by their titles. They're never referred to by name. It is also less clear what is going on in the book. There isn't a really clear progression and ramp up of mutations and things. It's more just kind of random unexplainable stuff happens but it's not nearly as clear um so so the book is quite different if you're looking to read the book that this was adapted from uh check it out it's a good book but it is different enough so you will get a different but similar experience it has not spoiled the whole book for you but the important thing is that the ventress character the psychologist in the book is the <laughs> has brainwashed all of the other team members in advance of going on the mission so that she has built in a trigger word. And the trigger word is annihilation. And if she says that word to one of the team members, they automatically kill themselves, which is awesome. The idea that you could just walk up to somebody and go annihilation and they pull up their gun and blow their brains out in front of everybody and they can't do anything to stop themselves because you programmed their brain to do so. That's that's awesome. And by comparison, I, I, I know I'm not saying the movie should have done that. It shouldn't have. Probably it, it might have been cool. I'm not saying it shouldn't. I don't uh, it would have been cool, but I, I get why it didn't, and it's not bad that it didn't do that. But if you're not going to do that, don't feel obligatorily compelled to have a character say the title of the movie anyway. And it's the same character, which is why it feels kind of obligatory. 
like he took the psychologist character named it Ven- named her Ventress uh, and still had her be the one to say the title of the movie. And it feels either obligatory or like a little Easter egg callback to the book, but it just kind of sucks in the movie and she just didn't need to say it. So I don't know why she did probably just shouldn't have said it feels kind of dumb. Uh, I guess that was the actual final last nitpick that I had with the movie. Uh, it's really good though. I swear. So who's that? And uh, lastly, we have the sequels. There are two other Annihilation books. So if you like this movie and you want stuff like this movie, but you can't get anymore because there's never going to be a sequel to this movie, you got a whole trilogy of books to read. So go do that. I'm not going to talk about anything that happens in those sequel books, but what I am going to talk about is what I think would need to happen if there were a sequel to the movie, because the movie begs for it with its ending. And I want to be clear, I don't think the ending of the movie is what is commonly referred to as sequel bait. Uh, That is where a movie ends and the ending is a big dumb cliffhanger and is designed for a sequel or many sequels because the studio wants to leave the door open to just harvest money forever with sequels, just like the MCU. That is not what the movie is doing. What the movie I think is doing is what Batman Begins did, uh, what, what Christopher Nolan's movie endings do much of the time, where he says, I don't want to end the movie in such a way where you know there's going to be a sequel. That's not the point. I want it to end in such a way where you can imagine the characters continuing to live and do things in their world from that moment. The movie ends, but it doesn't feel like the characters' lives have stopped or that everything has stopped. The world keep of that movie keeps going on its own, which I think, you know, you can say, oh, well, Batman Begins, the, the, the Joker card, it leads into the, the, the Joker movie, The Dark Knight. Ugh. Yeah, okay, but look at The Dark Knight Rises, which was definitively the last movie, planned as the last movie, is the last movie. The end of it is Christian Bale being on a date at a little coffee shop with Catwoman and Michael Caine no longer being in his service, getting to get up and be all happy knowing master wayne's out there living his best life and joseph gordon levitt finding the bat cave and taking on the mantle and becoming nightwing you know it's the movie doesn't just go we beat bane yay movie over or or just wrap everything up in a night little nice neat little bow it goes like hey yeah the movie's kind of winding down it's going to kind of end now but it's leaving the door open in your mind to imagine like and then alfred went and had a crazy rager because he didn't have to be a butler anymore. And he's like, oh, this is sick. I didn't realize how much I didn't want to be a butler anymore. And Christian Bale and Catwoman, I imagine, probably break up because I, she, I just can't see her staying in a relationship. That might just be a bias I have because of uh, the comics and their inability to stay in a relationship. But I don't know. I just don't think it works out. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he's just out there doing his Nightwing thing, being a knockoff Batman. But anyway, that is to say, I think Annihilation was going for a similar type of ending. It has the reveal of them both being doppelganger aliens, and then it is leaving the door open for your brain to imagine what they are going to do next or what is going to happen next. Not that it is trying to go, oh, cliffhanger, gotcha. You'll have to come back for the other four sequels we're going to do so we can make $5 billion. It's, It's not doing that. At least I don't think it is. I find it interesting to think about what is on the other side of that door. And what I see on the other side of that door is a sequel to Annihilation, which is basically the movie Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1978 with Donald Sutherland. It is no longer an alien invasion that the government is aware of, like it was with the Shimmer, where they were like, oh, there's this weird event happening and we're keeping it a secret, but we're keeping an eye on it. No, it's they don't know either of those people are doppelganger aliens. They're going to get released from quarantine and they're going to be together and they're going to replicate and reproduce because that's the whole point of the movie and the aliens goal throughout the whole movie. 
So I see a sequel happening where they've had a kid or multiple kids or they've been able to turn multiple other people into aliens or it's just 50, 40, 100, I don't know, however many years or decades later. And it's just, oh, the alien invasion is happening or has been happening and we didn't realize it. And by the time everybody realizes it, it's it's too late. They've won. Or, well, now that we've realized it, we can go to war and we can fight them. But there's more of them than us or just about as many of them as us. And, blah, blah, blah. and I just think that there's so much potential for like a civil war uh, within various countries and, and, or, or at least in America, because that's where the first annihilation takes place, like a civil war in America. It doesn't have to be a crazy monster sci-fi unknowable horror thriller thing anymore. It can just be invasion of the body snatcher style, uh, you know, secretly replacing everybody around you, secret alien invasion style thriller horror movie now. It can be a different subgenre and appeal to, I think, maybe a wider audience because Invasion of the Body Snatchers has a lot of appeal. Um, it might, you know, get some flack for being too similar, but I think it naturally lends itself towards that type of story. And it's an interesting way to approach a sequel where it's in a different genre or a different type of narrative structure. It is a movie that will never be, um, but, you know, it's, it's fun to think about. So think about it, I guess. That is, uh, that is Annihilation. It is an excellent movie that is really well crafted and very has a lot of little things very carefully placed in a line or two here or there throughout. It's very well paced, very well structured, shot, music, editing, performance, directing, visual effects, practical effects. All of it is very well done. It's a very well put together movie. I think it deserves more attention, but that it will be a sci-fi classic in its own right, even if not a widespread one. I don't want to call it a cult movie because it made $40 million at the box office, which seems too big to be a cult movie, uh, but it has that type of feeling to it where it feels like not many other people know about this film. So again, it's on Amazon Prime right now. I don't know how long it will be there. Grab somebody who hasn't seen it and force them to sit down and watch it with you or not with you for safety reasons. Uh, and you should totally just watch it by yourself or with whoever you are trapped with in your house at the current moment. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, just watch it or make other people watch it because it's great. And if you've already seen it, good for you again for somebody else to watch it for the first time, if you can. If everybody you know has watched it, you know, uh, watch it again, because it's good. Uh, read the books. There's three books. You'll never get a sequel to the movie, so try the books. I don't know. Anyway, that is, uh, that is Reference King for this week. Next week, I don't know what movie we're going to talk about. I'll let you know. I haven't decided yet. I'm deciding between a few. All right, that is it for me this week. That is Reference King uh, on Annihilation. Follow my Facebook and my Twitter for little competitions and games. You're not going to win any actual prizes. They're just, they're just fun to play. Uh, and for updates on what movie we'll be covering next week, in case you want to watch it in advance so that you can listen to the episode. Uh, that is just at Reference King on Twitter. And it is just Reference King on Facebook. It should be its own page. Simple enough. So I'll catch you next time.